Right. Cervical spine surgery. Um, I thankfully Jack did a little bit more of the anatomy, so you're fresh with why the nerve, where they exit out, and what what each can do. Um, I did a little more holistic approach, starting from why the patient comes to our office. That way, you'll have a little bit better idea of why they're now sitting in your room. Um, their words: neck pain, arm pain, numbness, tingling, weakness, balance difficulty, clumbiness of the hands. Sometimes it's just my doctor sent me or my chiropractor said I have a pinched nerve. Um, our terms are stenosis, the narrowing of the nerves of the spinal cord, radiculopathy, irritation of the nerve going down into the arm or leg, and myelopathy, kind of squeezing on the central cord uh, itself. Uh, the diagnostic workup, if they come to us with either zero or four of these things, we may add an additional uh, standard x-rays. Um, AP and lateral views also check dynamic studies looking at if there's any instability in the cervical spine. Then neural imaging looking at the nerves in the spinal cord and soft tissue uh, with MRI or CT myelogram if they can't have an MRI or if we need to investigate further with the myelogram. We sometimes use nerve studies to help pinpoint some other things to help delineate if someone's got um, a bunch of arm symptoms but hand symptoms that seem like carpal tunnel, they may have both. They may have a radiculopathy causing all their arm symptoms, but they may also have carpal tunnel syndrome. And we can tell them, hey, when you wake up, your hand's still going to be numb because we know you have carpal tunnel. Uh, the physical exam also is part of the diagnostic workup because they'll tell us one thing and we can find other things. We may find that they're actually stronger than they think they are, or we may bring up a surprise weakness that they weren't aware of, and that, that can help pinpoint uh, you know, certain lesions for us, although we certainly operate based on the, the image findings and their exam. Injections are sometimes used, um, selector nerve root blocks, if there's pinching on a lot of nerves and if we want to kind of tease out which one is the main culprit, the pain doctors in town can put uh, numbing medicine down around the nerve roots and we can figure out if it solves their problem 100% short term or not really, we, we keep looking. Uh, motor exam, as Jack said, that's very important, so it's in, I think it's two or three of my slides. Um, so we look at this in the office, and then we went over uh, zero, no movement, one is flicker, you can see something contracting in the arm or leg, two is, is movement with gravity um, eliminated, three is anti-gravity, can they just lay there and lift their arm up off the bed, but you push it right back down or their leg, uh, four is some resistance, and five is full strength. So we document in our, in our first time we see him, this exam for motor, the follow-up, we document it, the, the pre-op nurses have something similar, but we'd love it to get in, into something like this. Um, on the floor, I think Epic is working on trying to get this involved, so you'll see the same terms. Uh, because unfortunately, I may have a four out of five in someone's arm, and the pre-op nurse says it's moderately weak, which I don't know what that means for her or him. And then the post-op nurse says, well, it's also moderately weak. I don't know what that means for him or her. And then you see the patient and say, well, that's really weak. But maybe it's all the same weakness, and it's the four out of five that I documented two months ago in the office. Um, so that's, that's important for us. Uh, conservative treatment measures prior to surgery. Um, the standards, hopefully the primary care tried some things, but we'll, we'll also make these recommendations. Um, physical therapy, occupational therapy, chiropractic management, um, steroid medication. Notice there's no narcotics listed. We, we don't do that. Um, and this is typically for the neuro-intact patient. Uh, we like to, to act conservatively the best we can. Um, if the patient comes in and their pain is moderate, but they can't move their arm and there's a lesion or herniated disc or whatnot causing that, that weakness in the arm, will generally push a bit more towards surgery because the, the, the neuro deficits are, are big things for us. Um, I always tell patients I certainly care about their pain, but I care about their function a lot more. Uh, and that's something you can use when you're in the rooms. I to do it in the ER in the rooms with the patient yelling, they can't lift this up, remove that, and that's fine, but I care about that, but I care a lot more if they really can't lift that arm up. That means do they need new studies, they need additional surgery, they need to be going to the OR right now, you know, what's really wrong. Uh, if all that fails, or there's progressive radiculopathy or myelopathy, well then we talk about surgery. We'll go over a bunch of diagrams and models in the office and uh, consent them. The most common is the one I focused on here is the anterior cervical discectomy infusion or ACDF. That's the one you'll see the most. Um, everything's through the, the anterior approach. Uh, less common is the posterior approach. Uh, that is, there's a lot of indications for it. it and, 
Jack wanted me to mention that is the more painful of the two, so we expect pain posteriorly. Uh, when we go in through the back of the neck, that's a lot of muscle stripping, and it's, it's painful, and we'll do our best to, to treat patients in their pain afterwards. The anterior approach is used most commonly, not because it's less painful, uh, but a lot of the pathology we're trying to take out, the compression of the nerve or the spinal cord, is, is anterior to the cord. And it's a lot safer to go in and get it from the front. Pain control-wise, there's really only one thin muscle that kind of drapes down through the, from, the, from the chin to the top of the, the um, clavicles, and we cut through that, and the rest we just kind of move to the side. So the back, the posterior cervical surgery, we're burning and cutting and shoving and tearing, and through the front, we're just kind of moving stuff to the side. So that's a reason there is less pain. Uh, typically, the patient, well, is consented, they're identified in the operating room, there's general anesthesia, they're positioned uh, on their backs, will ex extend their neck with um, different devices, which is a surgeon preference. Incision on the neck, right versus left, uh, you'll notice some do right or left, and this is surgeon preference based on their training and their belief of certain nerves in the neck and what they think is going to be safer. Um, we dissect, we localize radiographs, and then perform the, the discectomy and osteophytectomy based on what we saw in imaging, what we need to do. Place the spacer, the plate, and the screws. I've got a picture. Uh, I had to do two in one because PowerPoint kept freezing and exiting every time I tried to do multiple pictures on multiple slides. The picture on the left is an MRI. It's a lateral view. The camera's aimed at the side of the neck. We can see the base of the brain, and we have the dark stripe here is the spinal cord. This is the back of the neck. This is the front of the neck. These larger squares here are the bones, and hopefully we can all see that there's an abnormality sitting here between the fifth and sixth bone. This, this is a large herniated disc. Coincidentally, this isn't the same patient, but uh, Google helped out. This is an ACDF now. They've had their surgery. They've failed concerted management. They came to somebody here in town or somewhere on the planet. And, and had the, the disc and bone spurs taken out. There's a spacer here in the middle. There's a plate on the front, and two, there's two screws in each bone. Typically, I don't have an AP view here to show you. And so this is what they come to the office with, and this is what you're meeting them uh, the next, you know, next few weeks on the floor with. The experience for the staff and, and the patients, uh, drains can be based if someone's a little oozy or surgeon preference, collar, uh, surgeon preference, some like soft collar, some will do a hard collar no matter what, some hard collar if it's a corpectomy, meaning we take out the entire bone, not just the disc. Uh, pain and swallowing. Um, swallowing can be difficult because we push and pull on the trachea and esophagus, or it can be difficult because there's compression from a hematoma. And I'll talk to patients and explain uh, I'm okay with them. It feels like they're swallowing Legos, but if those Legos end up in their stomach, I'm fine with it. If the, if the food is getting caught or the saliva or water is getting caught, that's what we need to know. I, I don't need to know if they're swallowing their cheeseburger. Fine, but it hurts. That's, that's going to get better with time. We look at their pre-op complaints. If stuff is uh, improved, worsened, no change, or new issues. Uh, we all want to see improved. Uh, we're okay with no change sometimes because sometimes we're working on this patient to prevent progression of disease and we know that there's a high likelihood they're so bad off at this point we want to prevent them from getting worse and any improvement will be a bonus. Uh, and then new symptoms. We want to be aware if, if someone has, is now taught to patients because we do push and pull on nerve roots as Jack said, if someone goes to sleep with left arm pain in the OR all the way down to the fingers and they wake up and the pain's gone but now there's a numbness in a part, part of their arm we have pushed and pulled on things and they, they can expect to sometimes have a new a new experience again motor exam zeros no movement the flicker gravity eliminated um, anti-gravity some resistance and then then full resistance and again that's from our office notes to hopefully we find a way to get pre and post up charting and then on the floor for you guys Additional experience and for you guys in this patient. Um, working from the inside of the surgery out, the epidural hematoma is going to be the largest concern. What that patient typically is going to be discovered in PACU, but sometimes can be delayed and up on the floor. And what that means is where we took the disc and bone spurs out and exposed the spinal cord and placed a spacer, 
there could have been some epidural bleeding that is now forming a large blood clot at that area. And like Jack mentioned with the cauda equina syndrome, where you're going to lose function in both legs, even though you maybe had surgery for just your left leg, we may have been operating for the left arm, but now someone's losing function in both arms and their legs and, and complaining sometimes of numbness because instead of the blood clot being here in the lumbar spine, it's up here. So it's going to be causing issues from there down. Um, continued or worsening radiculopathy or myelopathy, as we discussed, someone may not be better immediately postoperatively, uh, or we may have digging out that disc or bone spur may have really irritated the nerve we're trying to help, and that may be a new pain for them or worsening pain uh, in the short term. Uh, trachea and esophagus, we push and pull those to the side, so there will be some trouble breathing and swallowing. Any, any significant complications from surgery would typically be noted intraoperatively and would you know, uh, taken care of as, as indicated. Uh, voice we look for, we can cause a uh, change to the pitch of the voice because the way we push and pull on the nerves there. And that can be temporary or transient, I'm sorry, transient or permanent. The, it'll be a, a hoarseness to the voice. The larger concern with voice changes is if you're starting to see swelling in the neck and that's coming from com uh, compression from hematoma. So if they're struggling to talk versus talking just fine and eating but they're hoarse, uh, that's one thing that, that we need to be let, let known of uh, pretty quickly. Uh, again, pain with swallowing versus compression of the esophagus, we talked about that. Legos versus, you know, nothing's going down. Um, drain and incision, surgeon preference. Collar, surgeon preference. And then lastly, and generally remote from, from your day or two on the floor would be infection. Um, if someone spikes a high fever and is draining pus from their incision the next day, something is very abnormal, and I wouldn't expect that, but we want to be made aware of that. Goals of surgery, we talk about stop symptoms from progressing, uh, improvement is a bonus. It's not that cut and dry, everyone typically for ACDF is going to improve, but there are folks, if it's been long enough in this, that we're, we're, we're trying to stop the symptoms or from progressing. Um, radiculopathy, pain improved, function improved, myelopathy. Um, that's the balance difficulty patient or the, the hands, hands clumsiness patient where they can't button their shirt anymore. Those, they may look decent in bed and when you have them lift their legs up or move their hands or arms, uh, but then you, you watch them walk down the hallway or try to grab their fork on the table. So it's not just uh, the grip or bicep tricep exam, it's, it's beyond that a little bit. And we'll notice that and that'll be in our notes too because we'll watch that in the office. I can e examine a patient whose strength is great and then they hit the door jam six times on the way out the door because they, they can't, their, their myelopathy is that bad. Uh, Post-op and disposition, um, PT, OT, home health or rehab. Generally, we know in the office setting who's going to be doing your, your rehab. That's going to be the more longer myelopathy patient, the significantly off-balance patient, the patient that hasn't picked up a, a penny or button their shirt in six months. Um, the more acute radiculopathy, the fresh herniated disc who's got left arm pain for, for four months, they failed conservative management, it's worsening, they should go home the day of surgery or the day after with uh, pretty good relief and not need therapy coming to the house or therapy in the hospital. Important things, as I've kind of hit on before, um, the swelling of the neck. It's going to look like they've got a softball under there. Uh, certainly we want to know about that. That may not come with additional drainage. Their bandage may be great and dry, uh, but it looks like they've got a softball under there. We need to know about that. We need to figure out is this something uh, conservatively that can be something that can be treated conservatively or something that needs to be evacuated urgently in the OR. And that depends on what their exam is. If they're sitting there and kind of doing things normally and not, not in distress and, and you see that, we need to know. But certainly if they have this and you realize their, their saliva has come out of their mouth, they can't swallow, um, you need to call us. Uh, new or increasing weakness in one arm, both arms, all four extremities. That goes back to that epidural hematoma. Um, you know, if they're, and they're generally it's going to be pack you or early on but can be delayed is if they're sitting in the bed and they're not raising their arms up or they're not moving their legs up. That's, that's a call to us. We need to either image or go right to the OR and see what we're dealing with. Uh, pain, fever, and drainage. Fever and drainage, again, short term on the, that post-op day one you shouldn't have to deal with. Pain, uh, 
you will. But again, we care about pain, but we care a lot about the other things a lot more uh, for patient health and, and safety. Oh, good. Questions? Right. And then uh, my, instead of, I don't have family and I, I went to a great school, but I had an even better mentor and unfortunately he's already left, but yeah.